Our first speaker is Mark White. Mark White is an associate professor at the University of Virginia's McIntyre School of Commerce with academic expertise in areas of corporate finance and sustainable business practice. He teaches financial management in the school's ICE program and serves as director of the McIntyre Business Institute. He is very active in the university sustainability community and has developed and taught many courses addressing businesses' relationships with the natural environment. Professor White is engaged in a, a number of collaborative research projects related to business and sustainability. A former Fulbright scholar, he speaks fluent German and currently holds a visiting professorship in environmental economy or economics at the, and I guarantee I'll again pronounce this incorrectly, Technische Universität Dresden. At UVA, he has served as academic dean for the Semester at Sea program, president of the Colonnade Club, and a faculty senator. He published work, his published works include numerous articles, books, and book chapters related to finance and sustainability. Professor White, please join. So over the past hundred years, we've seen vast improvements in human well-being. We live longer lives, eat more nutritious foods, work shorter hours, and we enjoy a greater variety of leisure activities than in any other time in human history. We've explored the farthest reaches of our planet. We've put men on the moon and developed communications technologies that put the world's knowledge just a mouse click away. We are healthier, wealthier, and better educated than ever before. We have increased our stocks of manufactured and human capital, 76% and 32% respectively, since 1990, but at the cost of decreasing natural capital. These costs include the loss of one-fifth of the planet's coral reefs, up to one-third of its mangrove forests, one-half the world's wetlands, and according to some scientists, we can look forward to the complete collapse of the world's captured fisheries by 2048. How did this happen, and what might we do to fix it? Well, an economist might observe that many of the natural assets I just described lack prices because they're not traded in markets. No prices means no signals of scarcity, and no signals of scarcity leads to over-exploitation and overuse. I first encountered this situation in the early 1980s when I, was in a, when I was a PhD student in ecology. In one of our seminars, we read an article, The Economics of Overexploitation, by Colin Clark, a Canadian mathematician. The article described the economics of whaling, which I was interested in because I was a member of Greenpeace, the Environmental Activist Association. And the way whalers catch whales is like this. Whaling ships sail around searching for their prey, which they then shoot with explosive harpoons. Then they fire some more harpoons, harpoons attached to canisters of gas to inflate the carcass. And then they drag the dead whale through a big hole up the backside of the ship, where an army of workers descends upon the poor animal and turns it into pet food. Now essentially, Clark argue, argued that because whaling ships were highly specialized capital investments, with few other alternative uses, ships with big holes in the back aren't easily repurposed elsewhere, and because whalers need to earn a return on their investment, that it made logical sense to hunt whales to extinction whenever the required rate of return on investment exceeded the whale's natural reproductive rates. This logical conclusion bothered me enough that I thought I should take some classes in the business school to try and understand what was going on. So I did, and long story short, after a semester I dropped out of the ecology program and enrolled at the business school. One thing led to another, and after a while I earned my PhD in finance and came here. But I never forgot this lesson about ecology and economics. And then a few years later, I was invited to, I was awarded a fellowship to study the relationships between business and the environment in Germany. And it was here that I encountered the work of Frederick Vester. He's a biochemist and economist, and he's known as the father of cybernetic thinking in academic circles. Now, Vester wrote a book called Wie viel kostet ein Vogel, or what is the value of the bird? What is the value of the bird? 
in which he argued that if you were to take a bird like this Blaukelchen, this is a bird that's kind of like a robin, and if you put it in a bomb calorimeter and boil it down to its basic ingredients of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and a little bit of sulfur, you get about two cents worth of materials. But if you were to take, consider all the benefits that a bird supply to us, you actually figure out they're worth about $180. How did he come up with this figure? Well, he figured out, he says, birds provide us with tranquility and relaxation services. And that's worth about $25 a year, which is about the year's supply of Valium for that. And then he went and he said, birds do other things too, right? Birds catch insects like those bug zappers, and they are, are helpful in planting trees and seeds. And he said, if you add up all those things, the value of a bird actually exceeds the value of its material components. And I thought that was pretty interesting. Because you see, we're familiar with the value of many of nature's products. Food, fuel, fiber, and the like. But nature's services, they have value too. Ecosystem services refers to the benefits that humans receive from nature. For example, trees and other plants mitigate climate change by sequestering carbon in their trees and roots and leaves, or trunks and stems and roots. Swamps and wetlands, they soak up rain, reducing the risk of floods. Forests purify water flowing into streams and lakes, and ultimately us. Bacteria and worms decompose organic material, turning it into soil. Phytoplankton, those microscopic plants that live in the ocean, they're responsible for 50 to 85 percent of all the oxygen in the atmosphere. Bees and other pollinators pollinate more than 150 food crops in the United States alone and nine out of ten of our ten top medicines, and more than half of the world's population still relies on plants for treating illnesses and ailments. Taken all together, these services add up to one pretty penny. In 1997, Bob Costanza, an economist, and his colleagues estimated, or they published a paper estimating that the total value of all the services provided by nature came out to around $33 trillion a year. To put that in comparison, world GDP that year was only 18 trillion, so we're talking almost twice as much. Now again, as a finance guy, I found all of this stuff pretty fascinating, and I became interested in putting a price on the planet and learning ways to value environmental assets. There's a number of techniques one can use, ranging from the benefits transfer approach used by Costanza Investor, but there's some others, like the contingent valuation uh, method, which you can use to measure non-use values. I actually employed this method in a paper I wrote a few years ago estimating the value of Virginia's endangered species. I found that respondents said they would be willing to pay on average $500 to preserve the Commonwealth's population of bald eagles, which was an endangered species at the time. But they were only willing to pay $10 to save the northern flying squirrel and the snuffbox mussel that only rated a dollar. <laughs> now, these findings are actually consistent with what we see with human behavior in these revealed preference me methods. Humans are biased in favor of what we call charismatic megafauna. You know, pandas and tigers and lions and like. Mollusks, they really don't make the cut, generally. So determining environmental values, determining economic values for environmental assets facilitates decision making and the evaluation of trade-offs among competing wants and needs. It's also the first step in creating compensation schemes encouraging the provision of ecosystem services. Now this practice has actually had some very notable successes, such as the New York City and Catskills Watershed, an interesting story. So the Catskills Watershed has supplied New York City with high quality water for many, many years. But in the 1990s, the US EPA found that the water coming into the city was of such poor quality that they were going to need to build a new plant, a new filtration plant, at a cost of six to eight billion dollars. This decline in quality had come due to the development of the watershed, development from runoff and sewage and intensified agriculture, fertilizer, what have you. They estimated the costs of restoring the watershed at one to one and a half billion dollars, much less than the cost of that new plant. So in 1997, the city floated a bond issue and used its proceeds to protect the watershed by buying land, purchasing conservation easements, and paying farmers to not use pesticides and herbicides and to not graze their cattle near the streams. It's been 15 years now and the decision seems to have been a good one. The watershed's value has been internalized, and all parties seem to be happy with that new arrangement. Costa Rica may well be the poster child for countries that take natural capital seriously. After many years of resource exploitation, the government implemented a payment for ecosystem services system. 
such that they pay compensation to landowners who keep their land in forests or plant additional trees. And since 1997, nearly one million hectares of forest has been restored, and forest cover has increased to more than 50%, up from just over 20% of the 1980s. Interesting thing the Ticos have learned along the way include to use simple indicators and to bundle these services together for maximum value and to reduce monitoring costs, to target specific groups, such as the small landholders, and to tune payment levels to the local cost to avoid open payments. This is a big challenge, getting the prices right when you're trying to value environmental assets. And as neat as the Catskills and the Costa Rican experiences have been, they're still essentially negotiated agreements between small numbers of buyers and sellers. Markets are where things really get interesting, because that's where you can really open the game to a lot of players. Recent years have seen the development of full-blown markets for ecosystem services. Currently, the three largest are forest carbon, water, and biodiversity all of which are expected to be multi-billion dollar markets by 2020. These ecosystem service markets include compliance markets like the Kyoto Protocol and wet plants mitigation banks, but also voluntary markets that generate offsets. Both of these are generating a lot of interest in the financial community, and especially the ones for water right now. Not included in this chart, but still pretty important, are markets for certified agricultural and forest products, for instance, coffee and cocoa. These markets, which total actually over $100 billion, are expected to triple by 2020, driven primarily by consumer demand by folks like yourself for more sustainably harvested products. In the private sector, firms are waking up to the challenges we're facing, to the, we're facing with respect to declining natural capital, and they're using environmental valuation techniques to identify strategic risks and to stimulate innovation in their own supply chains. Coca-Cola, for example, has partnered with the World Wildlife Fund to examine risks associated with water supplies. Water is Coke's largest ingredient. Darden Restaurants, which owns Red Lobster and Olive Garden and some other brands, they've committed uh, funds to rebuild troubled fisheries in the Gulf of Mexico because they want to make sure they'll still have shrimp to put on the barbie. One company that's running away with the idea is Puma, the German athletic shoe company. In 2010, they became the first major manufacturer to compile an environmental profit and loss statement, which assigned monetary value to impacts associated with the firm's use of natural capital. This was the first time a firm had actually done that. And this table shows the results. Puma's activities were responsible for the consumption of about 145 million euros of capital that weren't on their balance sheet. That's a pretty large figure to be not looking after. But secondly, only a small fraction of this amount, about 8 million euros, was actually attributable to Puma's direct operations. The rest of it was all of their downstream suppliers, the cattle farmers and the rubber plantations and the oil producers. So, so I've just taken you on a romp through the highways and the byways of environmental asset pricing. We began by noting that as a species, we've had it pretty good. There are an awful lot of us, and we're living larger than we ever have before. But that's not exactly true with respect to Earth's balance sheet. Nature provides us with an amazing array of important services, but these are diminishing in quantity, arguably because we haven't included their benefits and costs in our economic calculus. At the business school, we're rather fond of saying, what gets measured gets managed. So why have we only recently begun to put a price on the planet? Frankly, for most of human history, we didn't need to. We simply hadn't bumped into nature's limits in a big enough way, but that's likely to change. We're expected to have three billion more middle-class consumers by 2030, and as we've seen, key components of our natural capital have declined precipitously in recent years. The business and financial communities are incorporating more and more thinking about the risks and opportunities associated with ecosystem services into their strategic plans, and better measurement should lead to better outcomes. As individuals, a greater appreciation for the benefits nature provides to humanity can only be a good thing. As you can probably tell by now, I'm quite fond of our natural world, and I wish future generations the same enjoyment that I've experienced learning and working with Mother Nature. Putting a price on nature services helps us to make comparisons among different types of capital, to engage with corporate managers, arguably one of the most influential groups of decision makers, and it raises awareness about the challenges we face with respect to Earth's natural resources. It's a helpful and important tool for achieving a sustainable future, 
and we should do more of it. Thanks for listening. I'm Gary Schiff.